denk dat je niet zo vreselijk veel macht hebt om dingen anders te laten gaan. Dat gebeurt gewoon. Maar ja, ik ben wel blij dat ik uh, gewoon nog leef natuurlijk. Ik wil echt aimé. Compleetement. Distordu. Il est là, il est plus là, mais en même temps il est là. Quand tu as à les spalles un dolore, une souffrance de genre, tu apprécies aussi les petites choses. Tu n'as pas compté rien, tu n'as pas compté que tu respires, tu n'as pas compté que tu es en pied et que tu camines, tu peux courir. Tu n'as pas compté de voir le soleil, tu n'as pas compté rien. Tu es presque verdwaarst, dans une trance. Um, maar ik moet zeggen, de zorg eromheen is wel heel erg goed en ja, het was een heftige tijd, maar wel een mooie tijd. Welke gevoelens ik heb ervaren. Ja, je bent ontzettend nauw betrokken bij, uh, bij mijn vrouw, wat die meemaakt. En je, je, kunt daar, je kunt daar niks mee, maar je moet er uh, zelf mee uit de voeten en je hebt wel het volle vertrouwen, dat had ik wel steeds. Sono un medico di terapia intensiva, non un rianimatore, nel senso che lavoro con i neonati, quindi mi occupo di tutt'altra, di, di, di bambini molto molto piccoli, non, non, non faccio il loro stesso lavoro, però chiaramente il rapporto con i medici è stato condizionato anche dalla, dalla mia posizione, tra l'altro sono dei colleghi perché sono nel mio stesso, quindi da una parte avevo, ero sicuramente facilitata nel comprendere razionalmente quello che stava succedendo, cioè non avevo bisogno dei lunghissimi colloqui perché mi spiegassero um, per avere notizie cliniche perché um, era più semplice riassumermi le cose. D'altra parte dal punto di vista umano, dal punto di vista, dal punto di vista della um, Uh, dal punto di vista emotivo questo non è servito a niente, anzi forse ha peggiorato le cose perché uh, sapevo cosa poteva succedere e non volevo accettarlo. Ora lo che mi motiva è eh, migliorare la vita della gente. Già non è tanto la tecnica no? come quando eri giovane, perché arriva un punto che la tecnica è tecnica e non ha nessun segreto, sino le piccole cose che possono fare che marcano la differenza. El hablar con el paciente, con la familia, el hacer una educación sanitaria que nadie ha hecho hasta ese punto y tú no lo sabías porque dabas por hecho que lo habían hecho. Esas cosas son las que te motivan, el mejorar el cuidado del paciente. Il faut faire du cas par cas, en fait. C'est primordial. Parce que chaque histoire est différente. Y cuando vous vous trouvez en tant que patient, en tant que famille de patients, dans cette situation, dans un univers où vous ne parlez pas cette langue-là, cette langue faite d'acronymes et de termes techniques que vous ne connaissez pas, quand vous vous retrouvez face au savoir et que du coup vous vous retrouvez impuissant, que vous vous retrouvez stupide, que vous vous retrouvez humilié, que vous vous retrouvez démuni, comment faire Jokainen lääkäri varmaan pelkää komplikaatiota tai jotakin, että mitään niin ei, niin kuin, ei hiffaa jotain juttua, mitä, mitä olisi pitänyt hiffata, joskin siinäkin auttaa se, että arvoin tekee yksin, yksin koko päivä töitä. Näin nyt on nyt äkkiseltään mulle mieleen. And what scares me is that making those decisions and making those wrong decisions and the realization that that decision uh, of that decision in three, four weeks time, where you end up having a patient who, in effect, can be crippled by life-sustaining therapy, um, which may not have been in their best interests or the family's best interests. And that still scares me. And I think it scares a lot of colleagues, but um, intensive care is much more multidisciplinary now. And I think that has helped our decision-making um, and has reduced that um, fear factor. Honesty and Humility go a long way. 
And most patients and relatives understand that we're also human and mistakes can happen uh, and should be openly discussed. Οι ασθενεί όμω έρχονται σε επαφή με εμά, ιδιαίτερα αυτοί που βγαίνουν από το νοσοκομείο, πηγαίνουν σε κέντρα αποκατάσταση και ύστερα από πάρα πολύ καιρό έρχονται να μα συναντήσουν, γιατί ξέρουν τα πρόσωπά, πρόσωπά μα, τι φωνέ μα, τον αγώνα που δίνουμε μέσα στο χώρο για να καταφέρουμε να του σώσουμε, να επιβιώσουν και έρχονται να μα δουν, να μα γνωρίσουν από κοντά, να του δούμε κι εμεί. In particular, the nursing colleagues, we arranged a wedding for a patient who was at the end of his life and had decided to marry his long-term partner before he later died. And it was very moving to be part of this very special event in the intensive care unit. It's a real privilege to be able to support a patient and their family through that um, what I hope is the worst thing that ever happens to them in their lives, to, to be able to support them through that, hopefully to recovery, or to support them um, through uh, managing a dignified death. Il faut, il faut, faut ramener la vie. Pourquoi est-ce que tout est si blanc et voire gris? Pourquoi est-ce que ce lino couine autant sous les crocs des médecins? C'est insoutenable. Pourquoi est-ce que, pourquoi est-ce que tout est autant aseptisé? C'est pas trois photos qui vont empêcher les gens de travailler. Moi, je pense que c'est important de ramener. Euh de ramener de la vie à cet endroit où, euh, où on se trouve euh, à la frontière d'eux, au bord d'eux, on se trouve euh, dans une espèce de no man's land où on euh, ne sait pas sur quoi ça va déboucher. Quoi. La mia opinione della vita intensiva è fantastica perché mi hanno salvato la vita e dopo tre anni sono qui anche a un altro ospedale che mi hanno dato per morto. Per fortuna sono arrivato in questa terapia intensiva e mi hanno salvato veramente la vita. Solo belle cose possono uscire dalla mia bocca ovviamente perché senza di loro non sarei, non sarei qui, ripeto, non sarei qui oggi. Intensive care medicine allows me to learn something new every day. So every day I meet colleagues and I hear of their new technologies, new advances and progress in their particular specialty. But most importantly, every day is a different day with new challenges and I enjoy the interaction with my colleagues and most importantly with patients and their relatives. So it is a, provides a great variety, it's different every day and it's a specialty where progress is made on a, on a regular basis. Grazie perché mi hanno ricordato anche come si lavora. Cioè, io faccio questo mestiere, lo faccio da tanti anni, ci sono dei momenti in cui sei stanco, in cui hai, hai, hai le tue cose, nel senso che hai la tua vita, hai delle preoccupazioni, però Io ero serena quando andavo via, non perché sapevo che non sarebbe morto, poteva morire, poteva star male, ma era nelle mani migliori, sapevo che era nelle, nelle migliori mani e, e questo mi dava, mi dava quel minimo di tranquillità che potevo cercare. È giusto che uh, i bambini che mi vengono affidati e i genitori quando vanno a casa possano pensare la stessa cosa. Siamo nelle migliori mani, quindi dobbiamo sempre fare il meglio. Grazie a loro per esserlo il meglio.
the marathon at the end of May. Again, a marathon of eight hours with experts from different parts of the world to share what we've learned from COVID, how we can rebuild the future, and how we can come out of this situation together. I'm an anesthesiologist and I'm proud to be an intensivist. We, intensivists, are working together to fight COVID-19. Together, we are intensive care medicine. Hi, I'm proud of being an intensivist. We are fighting COVID-19. Together, we are intensive care medicine. I am an anesthetist and I'm proud to be an intensivist. We are working together to fight COVID-19. Together, we are intensive care medicine. Intensivist. I'm proud of it. Intensivists with various specialty backgrounds work together as a multidisciplinary team to prevent and treat temporary risk of death due to COVID-19. My name is Jan de Waale and I'm proud to be a surgery trained intensivist and work in intensive care. We work together to beat COVID-19. Together we are intensive care medicine. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on how to conduct research. Uh, my name is John Laffey. I'm an intensivist and anesthesiologist uh, from National University of Ireland, Galway, and Galway University Hospitals. As chair of the Translational Biology section, I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar on how to conduct research. Our first speaker is Dr. Mariangela Pellegrini, and she will speak on the challenges for an early career investigator in setting up a laboratory research program. Our second speaker in the webinar is Dr. Harmian de Groot, and he will speak on the pitfalls and opportunities for ICU-related observational research. Both speakers will speak for 20 minutes, and if you have any questions, and we strongly encourage you to ask them, uh, we will take them and ask them at the end of the two talks. So we will collate them uh, and ask them at that point. So now I am delighted to uh, welcome our first speaker, Dr. Mariangela Pellegrini. Mariangela is a young critical care specialist at the Academic University Hospital of Uppsala in Sweden. She's a postdoctoral researcher at the Academic University Hospital and works at the Hedensterner Laboratory in Uppsala. She is a member of the NEXT Committee and of the ESICM Research Committee. Dr. Pellegrini's research is focused on respiratory mechanics, and her main research focus is on diaphragmatic activity during spontaneous breathing and mechanical ventilation in patients with ARDS. Dr. Pellegrini uses advanced signal analysis and image processing to perform real-time synchronized analyses of lung imaging and respiratory mechanics. Today, Mariangela will speak about the available tools for planning and conducting good experimental research. And she will focus on the perspective of a young early career investigator. Uh, Dr. Pellegrini, thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to your talk. 
Thank you, John. Hi, I'm very glad to be here, to be virtually connected with you, with you this afternoon. In this short talk, I've been invited to describe the challenges an early career investigator has to face through his or her path to become an independent researcher. You would expect this kind of talk by an experienced and successful researcher. Well, I'm not but I'm actually living the early career phase of my life, and I'm, I'm deeply in all those uh, challenges that I'm going to speak about. We can easily describe concepts by the help of metaphors, and if we want to describe the life of an early career investigator, someone one will describe it as in this figure. Few doors, few alternatives, a door opening with new perspectives. This is a quite simple image, a too static metaphor. I would rather represent our life through this second image, a life full of challenges, new obstacles to, that have to be overcome all the time, several aims uh, as to be accomplished at the same time. During some particular circumstances, a early career investigator can feel life as this image. During our path through, uh, towards our scientific independence, we must cope with several aspects of our life. First of all, we need to be resilient and motivated. This is the most important aspect. Then we need to adapt to changes, to mobility, be always available, grasp opportunities at the right time and in the right place, confront ourselves with other people, learn and be challenged by our mentors, and be able to build our network with new collaborators all around the world. And then we will have need to have time, yes, because we are never going to say no to anything. And then we have a private life, life uh, much, much more. The first and the most important aspect to conduct a good quality research is your motivation. We need to be inspired, and you get inspired by clinical experience, by confronting uh, yourself with colleagues, by attending conferences, and by reading. Reading a lot, a lot of science, especially in your own uh, field of research. You will need to build uh, the basis of your scientific knowledge. Even if motivation is an essential start, this is uh, not enough. To grow as researcher, we need a stimulating environment around us that allow us to grow. If, uh, we, uh, if we are lucky enough, uh, well, the, re the research we are interested in, uh, in are already performed in uh, our institution. Otherwise, we basically can migrate everywhere. And for what concerns basic research, it's sometimes tricky to know where the laboratories are. It's not always simple to find information about the different centers that conduct that kind of research that we are interested in. One advice is to look at the affiliation for in those papers that are closer to that kind of research that you would like to conduct. In my case, my scientific interest brought me from south of Italy, Bari, a very warm and sunny place, to the north of Europe, to Uppsala in Sweden. Uppsala is a beautiful Nordic city, but well, this is one of the first pictures we took in Uppsala 2014. At that time, I was challenged by low temperature and snow. In my case, the laboratory from where everything started was and still is the Edenheimer Laboratory. The Edenheimer Laboratory is among the most prestigious research platform in Europe for experimental intensive care. Several groups of researchers from Uppsala, but also from all around the world, working in experimental research at intensive care, come to Uppsala to perform the most complicated and demanding experiments. The Head and Herna Laboratory is made of a, comp uh, of a competent team of people that help you and let you always feel at home. As a whole big research laboratory all around the world, 
it offers you a very open environment in which you can always confront yourself and your ideas with other researchers. At our laboratory, an annual international symposium is organized and it's an amazing experience of brainstorming and confrontation. Then you will need at least one mentor. There are several mentors in our life and also in research, you need someone that is uh, more experienced than you, that can motivate you, that can show you the direction and uh, coaching you and challenging you sometimes. In my case, I have been extremely lucky having two supervisors during my, during my PhD studies, two high-ranked scientists with focus on mechanical ventilation, Professor Hedenherna and Professor Larsen. I have learned a lot from them. Concerning mobility and mentorship, it's important to cite NEXT, the young part of ACSM. NEXT constantly try to help you, uh, young intensivists and investigators through the early phase of uh, their professional career. So one important advice is always follow NEXT activity by regularly visiting our webpage. Back to the lab, a research laboratory is not only the people. The lab is also the structures and the equipment that it offers you to perform your research. This is important to perform high quality research. In my case, the Hedenherna laboratory includes several theaters equipped with all is needed for performing experimental intensive care. The lab has the same instruments as in a normal ICU, as well as a direct access to CT, MR and PET. Then you have always to consider that a part of your equipment of your material, materials, you will need to buy by uh, your research money. And for what concerns the money, this is always a challenge and uh, for all kinds of researchers, experienced or not. Scientific ideas need money to become real. In my, uh, in my case, I've started quite early training looking for money. Yes, because to apply for research funding is something that you learn as you learn how to perform an experiment. Often you will get a negative answer and uh, your research will not be funded. But at the same time, you become better for each new grant you will apply for. There are grants that will provide you part of your salary, other grants that will provide you money for equipment. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to remember that uh, the ACSCM is always promoting research all around Europe, offering an annual, on an annual base grants to which you can apply. Several of them are for young investigators. I have applied for the ACSM award some years ago. I have never been successful after some rejections. At the same time, you will need to train to become a good researcher. There are a lot of important courses you will try to attend to be better. In my case, during the PhD course in Uppsala, I have attended several of those courses, but uh, it's never enough. Moreover, if you are aiming to an academic career, you will need to know how your university and how your institution work. One advice is, uh, in this case, is to always ask, uh, never be shy, always ask and try to get all the answers you need. One more challenge comes from the fact that we are early career investigator, but at the same time, we are also young intensivists. In my case, I became an intensive care doctor. At the same time, I became a PhD student. And these give you even more challenges because at the same time, you have to try to become a good researcher and a good intensivist. You have to train, you have to acquire clinical skills and experience, and you have to become a fundamental part of your ICU team. Then what is important is that the clinical experience will be important for your research because only in this way you will find scientific hypotheses. And uh, exactly on the opposite, uh, you will need to test your experimental findings in your clinical practice to feel that they are being meaningful. 
Then you need also to certify your clinical knowledge and uh, your competencies in critical care, taking the EDIC exam. And also this is a big challenge. Well, now we have discussed a lot of challenges, how to find a valid research hypothesis, a lab, the equipment, the money, how to try to be a better intensivist and investigator at the same time. But then when you have all this as basis, well, you know, uh, you need to know the method, uh, how to plan your study. And then you have uh, several tools that uh, we are going to go through. The first thing is that uh, you will need to write your ethical application and get it approved. Legislation and rules uh, can uh, vary from a country to another country. Uh, in Sweden, it's uh, your group's work at the authority that regulates the evaluation and the approval of experimental research. You will need uh, to have a training in laboratory animal science. And in Europe, the standard is set by FELASA. FELASA also organizes uh, all over Europe a lot of uh, um, courses about uh, this. Then you will need to know the concept of the three R's. This is a very important uh, concept that you will need to keep in mind uh, um, while you are performing your experimental research. The three R's are replacement, reduction, and refinement. Where well, replacement is uh, try to avoid or replace animal use in your studies, uh, for example, using cells uh, or humans. Reduction is when uh, the animal is necessary so you will keep the number at the minimum. A refinement is to be sure to minimize pain and suffering and improve welfare. Then there are some guidelines that can really uh, help you through this uh, preparation and planning your study. And one of those guidelines is the PREPARE guideline, where PREPARE is an, an acronym for planning research and the experimental procedure on animal. This guideline is actually a checklist uh, for the preparation of study and is composed by three different uh, uh, parts. One is the formulation of the study. The second is the, the dialogue between the scientists, you and uh, uh, the animal facility the laboratory, and the third one is uh, uh, the control of the quality of your study. Then there is uh, another guideline, it's the ARRIVE guideline. Also in this case, uh, it's an ARRIVE is an acronym that is Animal Research Reporting of In Vivo Experiments. And the ARRIVE guidelines uh, are developed to helping you reporting your studies. Also in this case, you have a checklist and uh, uh, this is very helpful to, to helping you to not miss important uh, parts uh, in your uh, study, not only by in writing, but also planning your study and uh, conducting them. It will be also useful for reviewer by uh, looking and evaluating experimental studies. Then there is a, a recent tool that has been uh, um, um, published by the NC3 uh, HER. It's a free, it's online tool that is called Experimental Design Assistant, and that will help you and give you advice in how to plan your study, how to uh, perform statistical analysis, power calculation, and so on. At the end, you get a flowchart of your protocol in all different phases, and uh, you will analyze all the uh, points that are important and uh, well, that where well, you can miss something. Our duty as young researcher is to take advantages of all those tools and uh, be sure that we perform high quality science for the future. One more step, one more challenge. How to get your, pu your work published? Uh, this can be uh, felt extremely exciting, but at the same time can be also frustrating because often it happens that you get your work rejected or some reviewers ask you to completely transform your study. 
In this occasion, it's very easy to get upset and give up. Never do that. Everyone, ever, even God, as you can read on the right side of the slide, can be challenged by a peer reviewer. So put that aside the hunger and work on yourself and on your study. If you have been lucky enough to get a good peer review, you will help, uh, this will help you improving your uh, uh, scientific skills. One more aspect to which you will be exposed will be the need of promoting your research. And this sometimes can be felt as a challenge. Produce and promote science are two parts of the same medal. And if the first come from the work of a single person or a team, the second needs socialization. Science imply the need, implies the need of sharing your findings and get them challenged by other researchers in a confrontation of ideas, which is the basis of a scientific process. And promote your science at conferences can bring several challenges. You have to know how to present scientific data, you have to fight your shyness and overcome your fears, for example, speaking what is not your native language. Normally, what uh, uh, works most is to think that no one knows your science better than you. The major expression of your scientific presentation skills is going to be tested during the defense of your PhD thesis. In that occasion, at least in Sweden, with some differences among countries, the PhD student will literally defend his or her thesis against the, all the open criticism and comments of an international opponent and of a committee that at the end are going to judge you in front of all people you care the most, your colleagues, your boss, your family, your friends, and it's a lot of pressure, but at the end, no one knows your science better than you. And at the end, you will enjoy a wonderful dinner with uh, hundreds of guests, and everyone uh, will celebrate your scientific efforts. Well, we come now to the end of this uh, uh, short talk. Through this, I hope I succeed in sharing with you some experiences and good advices directly from the battlefield. This last slide is to say that everything I discussed today, it's actually only the beginning of a long path towards a high quality research. So thank you and good luck. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pellegrini. That, that was a very interesting talk. We've already received some questions uh, through the SICM TV. And so I strongly encourage others who are thinking of questions to submit them, and we will uh, put them to Mariangela at the end of our next talk. I'm now delighted to welcome our second speaker, uh, Dr. Harmian de Groot. Uh, Dr. de Groot will speak on pitfalls and opportunities for ICU-related observational research. Dr. de Groot is a clinical fellow and a researcher in the intensive care department at Amsterdam UMC in the Netherlands. He has a background in statistics and a PhD in research methods. His work is focused on the intersection between clinical and statistical validity. Dr. Groot will discuss what sets clinical research apart in critical care from other clinical fields and how we can adopt our research methods to the core challenges of ICU research. I'm really looking forward to this talk, Armian, uh, and uh, I invite you to take the floor. Thank you very much, John. It's great, great to join you. And also a thanks to the translational biology section for inviting me to contribute something here. My name is Armian de Groot. I am a physician scientist from Amsterdam UMC and the VU University in Amsterdam. And for my research work, I specialize in methodological and statistical problems of clinical research that are more or less specific to the ICU. We'll see some examples in the next few minutes. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Now, the essence of translational biology is, of course, a bench-to-bedside approach to research. 
let's say as a translational researcher, you have identified an interesting biological mechanism in a preclinical model. At some point, you're going to want to establish whether the hypothesized mechanism is also present in actual patients. And a logical first step would not be to immediately start an intervention study, an RCT, but rather to use observational data to find the hypothesized association you're looking for using either an existing clinical database or even by designing your own prospective observational study. But it can also be the other way around. Perhaps you come across an observational study that reports a strong independent association between some phenomenon and patient outcomes. You, you wonder whether this is something that you ought to investigate in a preclinical model. In either case, as a translational researcher, you'll be interested in some of the important pitfalls of observational studies, either to design a study yourself or to critically evaluate the validity of an existing study. Now, I'm not going to tell you that correlation and causation are often confused in observational studies. We all know that. Yet this question of causality deserves some more attention. As a translational researcher, you are specifically interested in causal questions. So let's take a look at the prohibition of cause on causal language in the reports of observational studies. We can take the following statement. Low plasma ascorbic acid was independently associated with increased mortality risk after adjusting for severity of illness. As you can imagine, this statement could be from the conclusion of a real observational study. But what is the point here? Are we interested in the prognostic significance of ascorbic acid, or do we want to use it to calculate the patient's risk of death? Why not state the causal goal explicitly? Because the argument goes an observational study can never prove causation. This is true. So given that we can never prove a causal link, the standard advice from most researchers, editors, and reviewers is this, don't ever mention causality in an observational study. But I disagree, and so do many statisticians. Cloaking the causal goal of an observational study leads to inappropriate statistical methods and misleading conclusions. So what value should we attach to statements like this? Let's start at the beginning. A scenario we often encounter in critical care research is this. We want to estimate the effect of a treatment on mortality or any other outcome. The problem is that the initiation of the treatment is associated with a patient's baseline risk of illness or a patient's baseline severity of illness, I'm sorry. The sicker a patient is, the more likely he or she is to receive the treatment we are investigating. Because severity of illness is also, also influences death, it is a confounder. By randomizing treatment, we make sure that the exposure is influenced by nothing but chance. We can now arrive at an unbiased estimation of the effect of exposure on outcome. But randomization is often not possible, so we have to use statistical methods. With, for example, propensity matching or propensity scoring, Investigators try to sever the relationship between the confounder and the treatment to arrive at a pseudo-population that includes patients as if they were randomized. With logistic regression, investigators try to adjust the effect of the confounder on death. And both method methods can lead, in principle, to an unbiased estimation of the effect of treatment on death. But there's one obvious problem. We cannot observe severity of illness directly. We can only estimate it using a scoring system, such as the Apache score or a SOFA score or the simplified acute physiology score, et cetera. Now, these severity of illness scoring systems are not perfect, and obviously, a poor scoring system cannot make a good risk adjuster. So we must ask, how well does a severity of illness scoring system need to perform to lead to a truly unbiased estimation of the effect of treatment on outcome. 
Michael Schoding and colleagues at the University of Michigan tried to find an answer to precisely this question. When do confounding by indication and inadequate risk adjustment bias critical care studies? A severity of illness scoring system should be able to discriminate between patients who are going to survive and those who will not. And the quality of this discriminating ability is expressed as the area under the ROC curve. Now, using simulation methods, Michael Schoding shows that if we aim to adjust the relation of interest by a severity scoring system, such a system must have an AUROC of 0.74 or higher. If we use a score with less discriminating ability, this may lead to false negative results, or even to results that are opposite to the true effect. And they conclude that in studies with 10,000 patients, even with low confounding by indication and a severity score with an AUROC of, let's say, 0.68 to 0.72, a beneficial treatment will appear harmful in a majority of studies. So we must ask, do most severity of illness scoring systems meet this mark? What is the area under the ROC curve for the commonly used severity scores? In the original publications, these systems score very, very well with AUCs in excess of 0.80. But in external validation studies, the performance of these scores is often in the range of 0.80. 65 to 0.75, exactly in the danger zone established here. So the solution may seem simple. We should work on improving the performance of the severity scoring systems. But unfortunately, it's not so easy. And to see why, let's consider another scenario. So far, we've looked at treatments that are either given or withheld. In reality, though, treatments are often titrated to effect, and this titration is associated with severity of illness. Now, can we find out, in theory, which dose of a treatment is best given any level of illness? Together with my colleagues in Amsterdam, we set out to investigate this problem. To understand what we wanted to know, have a look at this statement, which could again be from a hypothetical observational study. A positive fluid balance was independently associated with increased mortality risk after adjusting for severity of illness. What we wanted to know is under which circumstances are statements like this valid reflections of a true causal effect. So we built a simulation study, we built a simulation architecture, and we asked this question. Given that the treatment is titrated higher in more severely ill patients, and given that there is an optimal dose for each level of illness, what is the estimated effect of dose on outcome after adjusting for severity of illness? What we found was that common statistical methods, such as logistic regression, propensity matching, or inverse probability weighting, misleadingly demonstrated a significant association between higher treatment dose and death when the severity score is less than perfectly calibrated. So this confirms the findings from the previous study. But we also found that even if we have a perfectly calibrated severity of illness score, this bias, this biased estimation could not be overcome except under unrealistically ideal assumptions. Estimating the correct treatment effect required a perfect severity score, which doesn't exist, and perfect symmetry in the applied doses, and perfect symmetry in the dose-effect relationship. Now, all of this together just doesn't happen in reality. Finally, and disconcertingly, we found that, oh, I'm sorry. Finally, and disconcertingly, we found that for observational studies investigating a therapy that is titrated to effect and associated with severity of illness, larger sample sizes lead to more precisely wrong estimates. This is because the bias is systematic rather than random, and it means that a 50,000 patient study is more likely to find a false treatment effect than a 5,000 patient study. 
All of this led us to conclude that for observational studies, again, investigating a titrated intervention, the most commonly used statistical methods give misleading results. And because it's hard to believe, because these methods are used so often, you can try this for yourself. Together with the paper, we built an online interactive tool. You can first define how a treatment dose affects the probability of death, and then you, de you define the accuracy of a severity of illness score from very inaccurate to perfectly predictive. And then in the next step, you're able to analyze the study and you can try to estimate the true treatment effect. So the optimal treatment dose that you previously defined yourself. And you'll see that it is almost impossible to arrive at an accurate result. So what's going on here? At, at the heart of the problem is a phenomenon statisticians call endogeneity, which means in technical terms that the errors of a model are correlated with the explanatory variable. This endogeneity arises through measurement error, in this case of the severity of illness score, and through what you can think of as reverse causation, also called simultaneity, between treatment dose and illness severity. If we look at our causal structure again, we had hoped that propensity matching or logistic regression were able to lead to an unbiased estimation of exposure on outcome. In theory, this is quite possible. But if we add to this theoretical framework some clinical realism by stating that severity of illness can only be measured inaccurately, the estimation becomes muddied and often invalid. If we add some more realism by stating that the severity of illness influences exposure, but exposure also influences the severity of illness, estimating the correct association becomes even more problematic, if not impossible. The bad news is that there is just no way of obtaining a reliable estimate of the effect of treatment on outcome without additional data. But if we have some additional data, there is a trick. If we have a so-called instrumental variable, a factor that influences only treatment directly and not outcome, then we can arrive again at an unbiased estimation. Such instrumental variables are difficult to find, but not impossible. This paper is one example of an excellent analysis that uses an instrumental variable. So these were biasing mechanisms that are endogenous to the analysis. That is to say, these biasing mechanisms occur even though we include all relevant variables in the analysis in the model. But there are, of course, also biasing mechanisms that are exogenous to the analysis that we need to be aware of when designing or reading an observational study. Specifically relevant to the intensive care are the time-dependent biases. This is because the moment of inclusion in an observational study is often the moment that the patient is admitted to the ICU or admitted to the emergency department. And often the exposure we're interested in occurs at some time point after inclusion. So there is some time that the patient is included in the study, but not exposed to treatment. If the patient dies during that time, he or she cannot be exposed to treatment. But if we're not careful, such a patient can be compared to a patient that was exposed. This sounds trivial, but in fact, it leads to a very important bias, the so-called immortal time bias. And it happens quite a lot in observational studies. There's an excellent paper just out in the Blue Journal that I can highly recommend on this topic. Another factor to consider is time variable confounding. Suppose that you're interested in the effect of a trajectory of some biomarker over the first days of admission. Perhaps if the biomarker decreased over 48 hours, this is associated with poor outcomes. What you have to consider, of course, is everything else about the patient that changes in the same time frame. Ignore this, and the results may be biased through time variable confounding. And finally, it is important to consider the outcome of interest and whether this outcome is possible at all in every patient. Suppose you are interested in the relationship between plasma vitamin C levels and the risk of acute kidney injury. 
you'll find to your astonishment that severe vitamin C deficiency is associated with less risk of developing acute kidney injury. How can this be? Well, perhaps because those patients with the most severe deficiency are most critically ill and they die before they get the chance to develop full-fledged AKI. Death in this case is a competing risk for acute kidney injury. Now, all of these biases seem perhaps a little straightforward or not, but a quick screening of the recent literature learns that at least 90% of observational COVID studies suffer from at least one of these time-dependent biases. So where do we stand? A new look at this statement. Exposure X was independently associated with increased mortality risk after adjusting for severity of illness. There is nothing intrinsically wrong with this statement. If the goal of the study was to find statistical associations, it has succeeded. But what many readers and guideline authors also think that this means is that there is some indication, some indication of a causal relation between treatment and mortality risk. But we should be very careful. What this actually means is nothing if we do not evaluate all the relevant biases that are at play. Depending on the magnitude of confounding by severity of illness and the accuracy of the prognostic score, the true causal relation may very well be opposite or contrary to the reported association. Even with low confounding and with a well-performing severity score, a truly beneficial treatment or exposure will be mistaken for harmful in more than 50% of observational studies. So this sounds like bad news. And the question is, are we completely lost? And the answer is probably no. To start looking for solutions, we have to acknowledge that the methods like logistic regression and propensity matching are techniques from the 70s and 80s of the last century. But we've now clearly identified the problems that lead to unreliable observational research. Those problems are a complex interaction between patient characteristics, disease characteristics, and treatments over time. Many latent characteristics are difficult to measure, and the course of disease is variable between inclusion and exposure. And finally, treatments are not delivered in an on-off fashion, but are often titrated to effect in the ICU. And it's not unlogical that if the problems are so multidimensional in nature, we need to find solutions that are multidimensional in nature. We need to find multidimensional data. Now, for a few years, the most famous example of high-resolution data has been the MIMIC database, high-resolution granular data with lots of continuous data points per patient. But MIMIC is American and perhaps not so relevant for the European practice. So we now have Amsterdam UMCDB, high-resolution granular data from thousands of patients in Amsterdam. And completely new is the COVID PREDICT database, a collaboration of more than 40 hospitals that now contains more than 500 million data points of thousands of COVID patients. Using this kind of granular and longitudinal data, we can employ modern statistical techniques to really learn something about the complex interaction between patient characteristics, disease characteristics, and treatments over time. I've already mentioned this example of an instrumental variable analysis, applied here very cleverly to answer the question whether early ICU admission leads to better outcomes than later ICU admission. Now, this is another great example. How can we quantify the complex interaction between disease severity, the trajectory of disease, the onset of delirium, and poor outcomes? It sounds very complex. And rather than simplifying this problem, the authors chose to use a marginal structural model, addressing explicitly time variable, time variable confounding, competing risks, um, the evolution of disease before delirium onset, and the baseline covariance. So 
how should we see observational research in the ICU? We should recognize that finding an independent association after adjusting for severity of illness is meaningless without an evaluation of other biasing mechanisms besides uh, confounding. Yet the ICU has the most data-rich patient population possible with ample opportunities for very valid causal inference studies. So we need not relegate observational ICU research with a causal goal to the junkyard of science, as long as we try to recognize and deal with all biasing mechanisms that may be at play. Thank you for your attention, and I think it's time for the discussion. In the meanwhile, here are some interesting pointers to material that you may or may not be interested in. Thanks again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. De Groot. Uh, I really enjoyed both presentations, and I think that uh, the future of intensive care medicine is in very, very good hands when I hear uh, just the level of expertise uh, that we've heard today. So we, we have a number of questions. Uh, at the moment, they're mainly for Mariangela because yours are just coming in. So I was going to start uh, with questions for Mariangela. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first one uh, that we got here is uh, you mentioned uh, the negative, uh, the concerns around negative results and the, maybe a pressure for positive results in the laboratory. And so a question was around, you know, how do we guard against concerns about data falsification? Uh, and, you know, is, you know, how, how can we have systems to protect against that? Well, interesting question. Uh, at the moment, I think that uh, the most of the work is do, is done by the peer reviewers and by the editor of the journal. Uh, when you, you send your paper in, well, your, your data are not yours anymore, so uh, they are free to, to be scrutinized by everyone. And uh, our, actually, our system is based on the, uh, well, uh, how to say, the uh, reliability of all the authors. And uh, it, it, it's a, it's a, it, it, that can be a problem and can be improved in the future um, by probably uh, sharing all the raw data and the analysis of uh, each uh, study and experiments and make it free uh, for the use of everyone that wants to come. What's your idea? <laughs> Yes, I, I think that's a very good point. I mean, the more data you provide, you know, the raw data uh, does help. And, uh, and I think there are advanced techniques statistically to show, you know, that data is, 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 is true or, or, or falsified. Uh, another question, uh, Mariangela, is asking about funding. And so they're asking about, uh, you know, commercial sources of funding, so pharma or foundations or or institutions, and how does one stay independent uh, of, of, of maybe influences uh, that come with funding? So how do you separate, uh, you know, the funding you get, say, from a company from the work that you're doing? Oh, well, I'm probably too young uh, to answer to this question. My, uh, I, uh, well, tonight, my, my funding uh, came from public uh, uh, institutions or uh, have never been founded by a company. Um, well, John, <laughs> that's probably a, a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, I think that's a fair point, Mariangela. <laughs> so, I, I mean, really, I suppose the only tool we have is the declaration of funding. So, you know, an honest declaration of conflict of interest, uh, and so to allow readers then to, to know that, right? But of course, the difficulty is maybe we don't always know if it, there is a full declaration or not. It's certainly uh, a concern. Uh, so um, uh, the last question for you, Mariangela, is about uh, your your animal models. And so the question is, how uh, you know what animals do you work with, and you know, why did you choose those animals? And how well do you think those models reflect 
the human condition where the immune system and comorbidities and so forth are more complex. Oh, well, each research has uh, its own perfect or more, more suitable uh, model to use. Uh, there are, uh, well, there is a part of the research study, the different kind of model that you can can use. In my case, uh, in, in mechanical ventilation and respiratory uh, physiology, uh, the, uh, the model that is most used is, is the SWIN model, so we use PIG, uh, because of uh, anatomically uh, and, uh, well, physiologically very close to uh, the human respiratory system. Uh, for what concern the uh, well studies about uh, sepsis and immuno uh, um, immunity and so on. I know uh, well more different models can be more suitable uh, and. Uh, I know, well, uh, that's, for example, Murin's model are not, uh, uh, well, can, can be the wrong, but, uh, well, it depends, it depends what, from which uh, kind of research we are, we are performing, which, uh, which model is uh, the best suitable for your purpose. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Angela. There have been uh, other questions as well, but I think in the interest of time, we'll move to, to uh, some questions for uh, Harmian. So, uh, Harmian, you mentioned uh, that illness severity scores function really quite poorly uh, in terms of how well calibrated they are and how well they predict outcome. What is the solution to that? Uh, do we need a, 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 a better score, a different score? Uh, or, you know, could we look at illness severity over time, perhaps, as, as a way of doing this? So, I, I think, first, the, the, the most important point is that uh, if you're doing an analysis like this, so you say, uh, I found an association between some factor of interest and, and, um, and outcomes, and I'm adjusting for uh, severity of illness at baseline. And I'm using as a severity score a well-validated score, say uh, the Apache score. Then we need to realize that this, these scores have been shown to perform very differently in in different studies and in different populations. So of course they perform best in the in the original publications, right? But then there are various subpopulations for which the scores perform either not so well or just poorly. So what I would recommend as a first step is just, if you do this, then report how well the score is calibrated and how well it discriminates in the population that you're investigating, which is quite easy. It's, it's a, a few lines of code in a statistical program or a few clicks, and you can put it in the appendix so that people interested in this, like me, can see, oh, all right, so how did the score perform uh, in in this study? Was it was it excellently or was it poorly? If it was excellent, then, then that uh, is another another checkbox that has been checked in the validity of a study. But if, if, it, if it performs very poorly, then, then you need to find other solutions. And then, like exactly like you said, secondarily, if, if if the analysis is more or requires more complexity over time, then I think it's important to find a scoring system that tracks uh, severity over time. So, of course, the most the most famous is uh, is the SOFA score, and that's actually been uh, that's actually been employed a few times successfully in in these kinds of studies. A, a third option is to develop your own. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing statistically wrong with developing uh, or developing or taking a basket of variables that you think is especially relevant for the clinical question that you're answering or especially relevant for the confounding that you think is happening. So if you're doing a study in, um, in COVID patients, and you're interested in uh, some respiratory characteristic and you want to, or, or some ventilator setting and you want to adjust the association 
for illness severity, then is there, are there good reasons to use the Apache score or the SEPS2 score? I think not. I think it's much more reasonable to, to take a basket of variables like the PF ratio, like other uh, prognostic variables, and just use that in a, in a, uh, in a statistical model. And the, what, we, what, would you, what you would call the, the degrees of freedom that you lose by picking your own seven or eight variables, if you have a thousand patients, that's, that's more than reasonable. So I think those are three important options. Okay. Thank you. So a question, another question uh, from social media. So it's a question, uh, they ask, uh, am I correct that adjustments for only severity illness scores are flawed, but that complex multivariable analyses are still viable? So can we still do complex multivariable analyses? Are they still viable in the ICU? <laughs> so again, there is the, like the, the, the statistical methods, they work, period. They, they do what they should do if you recognize and acknowledge the assumptions that underlie the, the, the analysis that you do. So if I, 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 can, I honestly cannot think of a situation, but if you can think of a situation that uh, the confounding that is taking place between exposure and outcome is only through severity, then perhaps using a severity score would work. But in many cases, it, 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 it's just not the case, so it doesn't work. And I think it's difficult to, to generalize like this, what, what does work and what doesn't work, because everything depends on the, on the type of question you're interested in. So even if you have the most complex and advanced statistical method, multivariate, uh, using um, uh, a marginal structural model and taking into account complex time relationship patterns, then everything you do can still be biased, for example, by a selection bias, because some patients may be in the sample because they were treated uh, further up the line, they were treated differently, and now they entered the sample while other patients didn't. So it's, it, it, I, I would say, keep it as simple as possible, but not simpler. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, and this is just a general question, it's the last question. Uh, do, is this particularly a problem in critical care um, because of our syndrome diagnoses and multiple, or, or, you know, our clinical syndromes and the fact that you have multiple organs involved and that the pathway to death is, yeah. is often not clear? Um, or yeah. is, this, is this a system-wide issue? It, it is, to a point, a certain a system-wide issue, but we have some problems in intensive care that make it specifically so, especially the, the complex time-varying uh, the, the time varying characteristic of the disease and of treatments. But we have to realize that if you believe that, that smoking causes lung cancer, then you believe that observational studies work. And they do work because no RCT has shown that smoking causes lung cancer. We know this purely from smart observational studies that have been performed in, in, in dozens of populations. And uh, each study has looked at another aspect, and uh, and and together the body of observational in that body of observational research we've triangulated that we're a hundred percent sure that smoking causes lung cancer. So in that setting, it was probably easier than what we're trying to do in intensive care medicine. Mm -hmm. We have some we have some specific problems that make it more difficult. But we also have some specific advantages. We have tremendous amounts of longitudinal data. And I think if we, if we can step back from the oversimplistic approach of just saying this and this is associated with that and that, and I've adjusted for severity of illness, if we can step back from that, then opportunities abound for, for observational research. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, a really fascinating uh, subject. Uh, uh, so I'm going to now close uh, the webinar. Uh, we are just one minute uh, to the hour. Uh, and as a chair of the Translation Biology section, I am really delighted that we had uh, such a great uh, webinar. I really want to thank Dr. Pellegrini and Dr. De Groot for two 
fascinating talks. And I've no doubt that you'll get plenty of questions uh, through social media after this. So thank you both. And to our audience, uh, thank you for uh, joining today. And please do forward any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. at the end of May. Again, a marathon of eight hours with experts from different parts of the world to share what we've learned from COVID, how we can rebuild the future, and how we can come out of this situation together.